This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. To the Lamb. Well, our scriptural text today comes from the book of Joel, and this is not of my own choosing. I was working on another message that I'm like, Lord, this will really bless the people in an incredible way. And the Lord says, no, 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 here, no, 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 this one. For this time and for this season. Here's the word of the Lord. Joel chapter 2 verse 13 notice do not tear your clothing in grief but tear your hearts instead return to the Lord your God for he is merciful and compassionate slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love he is eager to relent and not punish and I'm talking today from the subject the great return the great the great return during the pandemic, there were a lot of people that resigned off of their job, especially after they got their list STEMI checks. <laughs> and it was hard to get people to come back to work. And uh, I was wondering whether they would ever uh, go back to work. And uh, you'd pull up to the grocery store, to a drug store, go to various stores, and particularly in the restaurant industry, and everybody had a help wanted sign. Because people, they were calling that the great resignation. So many people had resigned from their traditional jobs that they were doing prior to the pandemic and we just couldn't get them back. And I, I just wondered whether people were ever gonna come back to work. Uh, thankfully, it, it seems that many people, I guess eventually after the STEMI checks gave out, <laughs> had to say to themselves, you know, what, what am I doing here? Hey, I got some bills to pay. And many of them realized that they needed to return to work. So we call that a part of the great return. But this is another great return that we're talking about today. It is when our lives have gone off into a far country and God is summoning us by the Holy Spirit to actually be able to return to him. This is a practice that actually went down through the scriptures. And so uh, when God is really doing something and when it really connects itself to our humanity, it is not a problem of one generation, but it happens pr practically in every generation. Every generation has their wilding out time. And their parents, I mean, even back in the 1800s, you know, when pe people that had children, they say, what in the world is this world coming to? And they didn't have television. And they thought their children were crazy. And they didn't have the internet. And they're like, these children have lost their mind now. They are having a roll in the hay. I mean, they didn't really have, have anything, but yet they felt that the younger generation was doing something else. And down through history, you can see the hand of God moving through history as people were wilding out, leaving the foundations of their faith in God, their faithfulness to, to God, to the church, to the temple, and they were doing their own things. There were kings that would rise up and that had a heart toward God. And then the next king that would replace them was a godless person. And so as the leader went, so went the nation. And, and this goes on and on, over and over, down through the scriptures. So constantly through the scriptures, you're seeing in different times, the Bible is written over 1,500 years, 1,500 years by 40 different authors in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And moving through all of the vista of time, coming down through all of this history, God began to speak in every generation to bring people back to him. In every generation, God raised up prophetic voices to bring people back to him. We are at that point again where God is saying, return to me, return to me, return to me. You know where I am. You know what you left. Return to me. I mean, he started doing it back in the, in, in, in the, in the Old Testament. That's what Joshua, it means, Joshua is a, is a Hebrew name that means Jehovah is salvation. It, it was prophetic of Jesus. And he began to, to, to speak to us through, through the prophets, Elijah, 
the prophets Elisha. He just started speaking to us through Isaiah and through Jeremiah and, and, and through Jonah and through Micah and through Nahum and through Habakkuk. He began to prophesy to us through Hosea. He, he spoke to us prophetically. And most of these prophets were speaking to the children of Israel who had abandoned God and were living. They were living as if there was no God. And they were calling the people back. In fact, in the opening chapter here of Joel chapter 2, he, he said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm. He said, listen, the, the, the people don't even realize your house is on fire. That the devil is running rushard over your children and over your spouses. And he is moving in dark places of their minds and of their hearts and leading them into all kinds of, of ungodliness and evil and wickedness and things that are uh, displeasing to God. And he's saying, hey, 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 sound the alarm. Let them know, hey, that you're off course here. It was an alarm to let them know that an enemy has come in while men slept. An enemy hath done this and you wake up and find yourself, how did we get here? How did we get here in this, in this insanity that is in our world today? And now there is a beckoning call. It is not an anger of, of just merely being away from God, but it's what drives that that comes off as anger is actually a deep love that God has for his people that he so desperately misses. He misses his time with us. God misses us. He misses us and, and he's just calling us back to himself. And so when he says here, uh, don't, don't tear your clothing in grief, but he says, tear your heart, rend your heart. In other words, don't let it be with outward signs of piety where you're looking religious and sanctified and holy. It's not about the external that, that really impresses God. God says, I want to do the deep work of what I do in the heart. God looks at the heart. Man looks on the outside and that's why people do lashes and they get extra thickness and length added to the hair and they do things with the nails because that's the outward. But God is looking on the, he's looking to see that person, spirit, the real person. He's trying to look to see whether there's love in there and joy in there and peace in there and patience in there. He's looking to see whether the real characteristics that look like the Holy Ghost are actually present on the inside. He's not concerned about whether your hair has gloss and sheen to it and whether your lipstick really pops with your outfit. No, 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 no. He's, 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 he's looking for the stuff that's in the heart. That's where God is looking. That's where he is concerned. God looks at the heart. God looks as the, at the heart and as a loving father, he's simply saying to his children, Come on back home. Come on back home. Come on back home. God has a, a way, whenever we start going away from God, he has a way of calling us back to him. Everything that God will ever do in your life begins and ends with a call. The last call that, you, that you'll get is a call to come home. But he calls us out of darkness. He calls us out of darkness. Hey, 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 come, 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 come back. God calls us first with personal conviction. He calls us with personal conviction. If you're out there wilding out doing the wrong thing, the first thing that God will do is that he'll put something that's uneasy, uncomfortable on the inside of you to say, you know better than this. Get up from here. You need to stop this mess. How long are you going to do that? Are you, are you getting too old for this? You still? He's just trying to, hey, 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 wake up. Hey, when are you going to put this away? It's personal conviction that begins to convict you on the inside so you know better than that. Listen, whenever you do wrong, here's a little secret. You're the first one to know. You know before your mama finds out. Nobody has to, you know, nobody has to tell you that you know that was wrong. That's why you were sneaking. That's why you were hiding. That's why you didn't do it right in front of mama, because you know she would have slapped you. But you go and you do it in a in in, in a secret place, in, in this hidden place place and so God uses personal conviction to begin to call us back secondly he, he uses prophetic warning God might use a prophet to call you out he may bring you to the house of God and he all of a sudden here comes a word of the Lord that begins to convict you your prophetic warning might come in a dream 
where you've been doing some stupid stuff and all of a sudden God gives you this dream that starts riding you and troubling you. You can't shake it. See, that's the difference. I mean, I'm not talking about some, some, uh, a dream that you done had because you ate something that, you know, didn't really agree with you and you, you done dream had you because you watched a horror movie last night. No, no, no. It didn't have anything to do with that. But when God is trying to call us back, he will sometimes prophetically speak to you through a dream that will trouble your soul. And you start seeing symbols and you know that, uh, that here that it was a black snake that was coming after me. And, and, and as God is saying that you're running out of here in the devil's territory now. That something, you were caught in something, you were falling. And these pictures that God is giving you in a dream are a prophetic warning to say, hey, 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 check yourself before you wreck yourself. He says, come, come, come back, come back to me, come back, come back. It's a, it's a call, it's a prophetic calling that God will use others. We'll still just check on us. Are you yet holding on? And it'll remind you where you are. You know, whenever God asks a question, he's not asking for information. The moment that Adam had sinned, God says, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. He wanted to bring it to Adam's attention that you are out of place. You have distanced yourself from my presence. And where can you go to actually be outside of my presence? But he just asked him a question to turn on a light. So God begins with personal conviction. Then he deals it to prophetic warning. Then he moves on to divine judgment. That is that God told you, stop that. Put that inebriation down. And the next thing you know, because you didn't put it down, now you come into divine judgment. And now you get pulled over for a DUI. And now, while you're in the back of the police car being driven to the station and being checked in, having your picture taken. <laughs> oh God, if you get me out of this, Jesus, if you just get me out. God, I promise, I promise, this will be the last time. <laughs> he knows. He knows. That's divine judgment. Now listen, the divine judgment is still not designed to destroy you. It is designed to put you in a situation that you can't get out on your own and you have to turn toward him and look it is God's way of saying I'm still calling you back to me you I, I know you did some stupid stuff you done messed up but you still my boo God is saying I still love you you, you, you still got a special place in my heart and and I'm, I'm I let you wreck because I asked you to come to me because I wanted you to be in my arms so I had to let you break your leg so you'd let me hold you once again. So even when the, when the judgment, the divine judgment comes, it is not to destroy you. It is so your soul does not go to perdition. He is trying to get you in a position that you cannot get out of this on your own. It is to turn you heavenward so that you see that God, I need you. I need you and I cannot get out of this by myself. I need you. I need you. So God is trying to call us. He's calling us and he calls us through various things. And I want you to just see that all throughout those years, in every generation, God raised up prophetic voices to be able to restore the people to himself because it was just a matter of time. It's just like a wandering dog. And they kept wandering off, but what the dog didn't realize is that the dog was on a really long invisible leash. And that's why as long as you got a mama and a daddy that's praying for you, you can only go so far and you'll be sniffing out in some of the most dangerous things and you'll be about to fall off the end of the world and about to lose your life and everything. But it's a, that somebody's got a leash on you and you, it feels like you're free. It is an illusion. You can only go so far before God will make you sick of your own mess. And there he'll find yourself in your own vomit. And that's why we don't return to our vomit after he... He's just trying to let us know that you, you need me. You need me and I'm calling you. I'm calling you. Return to me. He's saying return the great, the great return. He says here in Hosea chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. I love the prophet Hosea because he's a, he's a special man of God. He's, he's better than I am. Because God told him to marry a prostitute. I mean, you know, I'd have a challenge with that word. I don't care how fine she is. <laughs> and sure enough, he married her. 
Because God had him to marry her because he said, I want to do a demonstration to be able to speak prophetically to my people, the children of Israel. And he says, uh, when she, when she, after he married her, her name was Gomer. And she was married. She had a husband that was a prophet. But she still had a, she had a background. And, and she had an itch after a certain while. And she started calling some of her old customers. You know, she had some special customers. And, hey, hey, what you doing? <laughs> and she was with them while she was still married to the prophet, Hosea. And he said, in the same way that your wife is unfaithful to you, that's the way that Israel is to me. And he says, you know how that makes you feel? He said, that's how I feel. And not only that, she went on messing around. She got pregnant with children by other men while she's still married to him. It is the same as us going out here doing deals with the devil. My God, who am I talking to in this place? You know what you're doing. I mean, you, you know, and producing stuff that had nothing to do with God, nothing to do with your God called destiny, but you can produce nonetheless. And this is who Goma is. She's trying to show us ourselves. She was loved and didn't appreciate it. She took it for granted and whatever you take for granted will eventually be taken away. But God had him to marry, had her to marry a prophet, had the prophet to marry a prostitute to demonstrate the relationship of his own special people, the children of Israel, how they went a whoring after other gods. And he says, the way she makes you feel, Hosea, now I want you to prophesy with passion because that's how I feel. I want you to feel my pain so you can prophesy with the perspicacity of an eagle because you've been there. You know what this feels like to have somebody to cheat on you and you still love them. And so notice Hosea now prophesying, saying, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord and say to him, forgive all our sins and graciously receive us so that we may offer you our praises. You have to turn your heart, your head, and everything else so that you come back to God with all of you, not just certain parts of you, but you bring him all of you. God either wants all of you or none of you. He wants all of you or none of you. You got to give him your affections. You got to give him your struggles. You can't have a little secret room to say, God, I give you everything except this little stuff that's in this compartment over here. You got to lay everything that you have on the altar. He can handle it and still love you. Notice another prophet, Zechariah. Zechariah chapter one, verse two and three. There's a different prophet now. He says, the Lord was very angry with your ancestors. You thought you were the first one to figure out sin? Oh no, your grandmama, she, oh. Oh, her, she wasn't always just walking around with a flower dress on. Oh, granny knew but something about a rolling hay. She, she had her little, oh, oh, you didn't invent sin. You think grandmama, that's how she recognizes it in you. You weren't the first ones whose hormones were raging out of control. Grandma was a little girl one time that was in heat. He said, notice, Zechariah, I'm just trying to, I'm just, you know, I'm, I read this book in a modern day time. I'm like, you know, Lord, make it plain to me now what you were talking about. He says, the Lord was very angry with your ancestors, therefore tell the people. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord. Almighty and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Just return to me. Come, come back to me. Now listen, now notice, it's initiated with us, it begins with us. Most of the time that we think that we're waiting on God, God is actually waiting on, on you. It's like a game of chess or game of checkers. You got first move. And most people are praying and say, come on Lord, move, move God, move God, do this God, do this. No, 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 God says you got first move. You ever notice what James chapter 4 and verse 8 says? Come close to God and God will come close to you. Now notice it gives a responsibility to us. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. That's a, they putting the, he's put, putting a, a, a pin there on, on the head of it. He says your loyalty is divided between God and the world. 
Your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. He says, come close to God. Draw near to God, King James Version says, and God will draw near to you. But you bust the move. Your moving near to God will determine God's moving near to you. You initiate the process and God says, I will match your effort. I'll match your passion. As you come to me, I'm coming to, towards you. I'm rushing toward you. But if you want God, he says, start making your move toward me. And see, we get it mixed up because, you know, we sing the beautiful song like, you provide the fire, Lord, I provide the sacrifice. But you see, the way that it actually works, we have to provide the sacrifice first and then God sends the fire. God sends fire in response to a sacrifice. He never sent fire on an empty altar. So when a sacrifice is placed on the altar, then that's where the fire of God falls. Whatever goes on the altar gets the fire. And that's why he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Because if you need the fire of God to fall on you, you need to die to yourself and climb up on the altar. And as you get on the altar and make a sacrifice to God, the power of God will come into your life in an incredible way. It is where you are drawing near unto him and now he will draw near to you. It is your putting an, a sacrifice on the altar and God will send the fire. If you put a seed in the ground, God will send the rain. He doesn't send rain where there is no seed in the ground. That's why it doesn't rain in the desert. Who sows seed in the desert? But God sends water from on high, Isaiah chapter 55, and said, even as the rains come from the earth in order to cause the seed to, uh, to spring forth and bring forth, he says that so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It is not going to return unto me void. He says, in the same way that I send the rain, to produce, cause your seed to open up and to germinate. I declare you, I double dog dare you to start sowing the seeds of the kingdom. Sow the seeds of the kingdom. Sow the seeds of the kingdom of God and God will send the rain. You begin to pray and God will send the rain. I'm, I'm telling you, God will either send rain or he'll send fire. And some fires that the devil has set, if you pray, then God will send the water of the spirits to begin to extinguish that fire. But when it's been dry in your life, if you'll sow a seed, God will then send the rain. He'll send the rain and rain on your field and rain on your seed and a harvest of glory will begin to come into the earth. We provide the sacrifice and God sends the fire. He sends the fire. He sends the fire. Nehemiah, who was the king's cupbearer, was, was there serving the king. And all of a sudden, you know, he gets the news that the walls of Jerusalem were in ruin and that the gates were burned. And it is a prophetic picture. This is America. The walls are down. Walls are there for protection. And that's why we have is issues with immigrants. And that's why we've got so many issues that they have politicized now. Uh, but our walls are down spiritually. Yes. Walls are, 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 they delineate territory. They create barriers. They are there for distinction. And when you bring the, the, the walls down, you don't know your country from anybody else's. Yes. You don't know what's an area of safety or when you've gone into enemy territory. You see, what the devil does, he blurs the line before you cross the line. See, now he's torn them down and acting as though there is no difference. And so now we are dealing with a confused identity because the walls are down. And so he's just trying to tell us, the walls are down, the walls are in ruin. There's nothing there to help you to be able to see that I set a, a, a distinction there. God always set a distinction between righteousness and unrighteousness, between light and darkness, between good and evil. And when you start blurring the lines, you easily cross, they've taken it down to say, it makes no difference. Yes, it does. That is the reason that he put the sun there to rule the day and the moon there to rule the night to say there is a difference. Don't treat it like it's all the same. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who hath sent me while it is day for the night comes when no man can. There is a difference between day and night. We are children of the light. 
and not children of darkness. There is a distinction. There's a distinction. And I'm here to tell you that when he comes, he's going to separate the sheep from the goat because there is a difference. There's a difference and the walls have been brought down to where we don't know like a man and a woman, like there is no difference. There is a difference. Let's take a look and see what Nehemiah was saying. Nehemiah said in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 3 through 9, And they said to me, Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. That's where we are in America. The wall of Jerusalem, it's their spiritual capital, has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Gates are very critical places because gates are places of influence and power. Gates represent authority. That's where the the power brokers of the city met and discussed important matters. That's where the businessmen met. It was at the gates. And this is why Jesus said to Peter, he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the very gates, the authority of hell, will not be able to prevail against what I'm building in my kingdom. That's what Jesus was teaching us. He says, the gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse 4, he says, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. Some things ought to break your heart. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. And then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, and great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commandments, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family, and I have sinned. Own it, own it, because if you don't own it, you can't disown it. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, the decrees, and the regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses and so he says please remember what you told your servant Moses that if you are unfaithful to me I will scatter you among the nations you'll be in exile but if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them if you return if you return then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth I will bring you back I will bring you back I will bring you back. I will restore you to the place that I have chosen for my name to be honored. Everything that you've lost, God says, I am a restorer. I can bring your mind back. I'll add years onto you. I'll give you mental clarity. I'll be able to give an anointing upon your life so that you can get more done in less time. If you come back to me, I'll give you your focus back. I'll give you your strength back. I'll bring partners that will multiply you and take what you are doing to an exponential level and you'll be able to literally get more done in less time. If you'll ever come back to me, if you'll come back. Jesus let us know in Matthew chapter 7, he said to us, enter in through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the, is the road that leads to destruction and many uh, be that, go, that, that enter through it. He says, but, but the small, But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few that find it. Because see, one of the the gates that the devil uses that has brought everybody else, it gives you a clue, world wide web. Wide is the way. Can you imagine how many marriages that have been messed up because of some adulterous affair that started through a flirtatious relationship? Are you listening? Through a world wide web, it's a gate. It is a portal. It's a portal. Now, I I don't, listen, I mean, I'm on the internet. It doesn't mean that because it is there, you know, just because I'm selling drugs at my door doesn't mean that everybody has to be selling drugs at the door. You see, you understand what I mean? So it can be used for good and it can be used for evil, but it is a portal. It is a portal. And if your heart is not sanctified, you'll use that portal for corruption and destructive purposes. And wide, it's the world wide web. That world wide, the internet is a portal. It is a portal. It's a portal. And then they have this thing that's called the dark net. It's a portal to where demons come out. There is a sickness that gets in people. And where a a man possessed of the devil will be on somebody sexually or physically abusing them. And then he'll say, why did you make me hurt you? He's not talking to the person, he's talking to the demon. Why did you make me do that? It's a demon at work. Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah is crying out to the nation. 
And he's crying. He, he, was, he was called the weeping prophet because there was so much sin. And it is my prayer, oh God, may you break my heart with the things that break your heart so that I can hate what you hate and love what you love. God, break our hearts with what breaks your heart. That ought to become your prayer. Jeremiah spent this time in, in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 38. Notice he says, does not the Most High send both calamity and good? Then why should we mere humans complain when we are punished for our sins? But notice he says, instead, let us test and examine our ways. Let us turn back to the Lord. Since instead of getting mad about stuff that happened to you, take a look in the mirror. Examine yourself. Test, see, is my heart right? Have I been living according to your standards, God? And he says, if you haven't, he says, just return. Just ret don't try to justify yourself. Don't try to explain it as to why you did it. Just return. Just return. He's, he loves you. He's, God is not your enemy. He loves you. He's not your enemy. He loves you. He loves you. But it is our sin that separates us from God, and it is our repentance that restores us back to relationship with him. The prophet Hosea again says in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2, notice, come and let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces and now he will heal us. He has injured us and now he will bandage our wounds. He will bandage our wounds. And in just a short time, he will restore us so that we may live in his presence. Notice that God's going to restore us. God's going to restore us. That's a good news. I didn't come with bad news today. I came with good news. God is going to restore us. You lose the joy of your salvation when you backslide. You lose your joy. You lose your peace. Oh, God, may you restore us. May you restore us. May you restore us. And I'll tell you this, that when God begins to wound us, we often cry. But God captures our tears in a bottle. Those are not my words. The Bible says it in, in uh, Psalm chapter 56 and verse 8. Notice, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. You know, you matter so much to God that God would have a collection of your tears. Uh, there was a, a woman by the name of uh, Rose Lynn Fisher that wrote a book called The Topography of Tears. The Topography of Tears. She said that the tears are an aerial view of, of our emotional terrain. And, and what she did, she, she uh, took uh, teardrops that came from a person that was crying out of grief and sorrow and put them on a slide, a glass slide, and, and looked at them under the microscope. And, and, and they were sparse and they were pointed and jagged. And, and it, was a, it was a pitiful and scary looking sight up under the microscope to see tears that had crystallized and, and the crystals that they, that they formed. And that was the ones under grief and sorrow. And then she also took the tears that came from laughter and examined them under the microscope and they were full and round and fluid and beautiful. And under that, the, those crystallized tears showed a different picture. So God had an aerial view, a topography of our emotional life to know when we were happy and when we were sad. And it's not an either or. Life is filled with mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. And while you're on top of the mountain, you're laughing, saying, I made it, I made it, and I'm on top of the world. But then there's a valley experience that happens after that. And that's when we are crying in the valley and wondering if God still loves us and wondering what we did wrong and why we going through all this and why he leave me. <laughs> he ain't called me in like two days. And we're going through all of these emotions. It's, it's the mountain and valley experiences that some things that will happen to you in this life will make you laugh and some that will happen that will make you cry. And it, God designed it so that our tears, loaded in your tears, are toxins. Which is one of the reasons that after you have a good hard cry when you've been depressed or sad or upset, you feel so much better physically because you've just ridded your body of toxins that make the body sick and can give you a down feeling. You're, you're expelling those things out through your eyes. They're in your tears. Sorrowful tears are full of toxins, but not the happy ones. 
But that's why you feel so much better after a good hard cry, even when nothing in your situation has changed. But you've gotten it out. And that's why God says, I'm going to collect your tears in a body because you mean something to me. And every time you hurt, I hurt. And when you rejoice, I rejoice with you. And God says, I got you. I know you. And my heart is empathetic towards you. I feel you. And he says, you mean so much to me that I am capturing a, 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 a topography of your emotional life of all of the times that you've gone through things and wondering whether God even cared about you. He sees you every time you cry yourself to sleep, every time you're hugging a pillow in a bed all by yourself going to sleep. You wonder, does God? Absolutely, he knows. Not a tear can escape your eye out of your tear duct without God knowing about it. Not one strand of your hair can come out of your head. Every strand that is in your brush or in your comb, God knows about it. It doesn't leave your head without God knowing about it. He knows. He can, he's the only one that can count every strand of hair on your head. The ones that are gray up underneath the color. He knows. He knows every real one that you have under the weave and under the wig. He knows. He knows. He knows. Our tears are a microcosm of the collective human experience and they mean something to God and God holds it dearly. And God does not keep bad things from happening for us because that's the way that life is. It rains on the just as well as the unjust. But we have an anchor because we know the Lord. And see, and this is what separates us, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 says this to us, that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. And here's what I say, this other part here is not actually a part of the scripture, but it's godly sorrow is sadness for offending God that leads to changing one's wicked ways and being reconciled with God. That's what it is. Godly sorrow. You wonder what is that? It is sadness for offending God that leads to changing one's wicked ways and being reconciled with God. When you realize I was breaking God's heart, it's that godly sorrow that then leads us to repentance. Sadness over earthly trouble, because you know you can cry because your car got messed up in an accident. That leads to depression. But godly sorrow leads to repentance. The prophet Hosea again began to prophesy in Hosea chapter 12 and verse 6. He said, but as for you, return to your God, hold fast to mercy and justice. Did you know that God's a God of justice? He's also a God of mercy. He's the only one who is smart enough because he knows all of the circumstances and he understands everything that contributed to that in a way that no other human judge could know. But God, the ultimate judge of all, is both merciful and a God of justice. And he says, and wait on your God continually. To wait on means to serve, serve God continually. Notice what Isaiah the prophet began to prophesy in Isaiah chapter 55, verse six and seven. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. We have our own kind of thinking because your life is determined by your thoughts, your talks and your tasks. Those three, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God he will abundantly pardon. Listen, this is not just written to men, this is written to women too. I hope you know that. You have to put your gender in there. It says, let the wicked forsake her way. You know, women have rooms too. Some of you will get that later. <laughs> let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let her, let her return to the Lord and God will have mercy upon her and to our God, he will abundantly pardon. God will abundantly pardon us, man or woman, boy or girl, God will abundantly pardon us. He will. Notice the prophet Malachi, the one that closed out the whole Old Testament. Malachi chapter three, verse seven through nine. Notice what he says here. From the days of your father, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. And he simply said, please with them, return to me and I will return to you. He says it again, another generation. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? They're wondering, how do we return? And notice what he says. Will a man rob God? 
Yet you've robbed me, but I say, how have we robbed you? And he says, in tithes and in offering. And you are cursed with a curse, your whole nation, for, who you, uh, for you are robbing me. Do you realize Jesus taught us the principle that where your treasure is, there is your heart also. The tithe is holy to God. It belongs to him. I've been a tither all of my life. Not because the preacher at our church said it, but because I watched my parents do it. I watched the blessings of God come in their life. And I did read it in the word of God. And I practiced it all of my life. And it's a principle. And so God was saying, even to the priests who were not tithing, he said to them in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6, he was writing to the priest. He said, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is mine honor? Honor is money. That's why we call it an honorarium. It's money. We honor the Lord with the tithe and the first fruits of our increase, the tithe and the offering. When you return to God, you're willing to return to Him and to give Him not only your heart, you give Him your finances that says, God, you know, when, when a person gives their finances, they say, like, you really see. I mean, when you do that, you're saying, God, you have all of me because where my treasure is, there will my heart go also. If you're invested in a stock heavily, you're going to check that stock. If you don't have anything invested, you, why would you check the stock market if you don't have anything invested in it? Wherever your finances go, your heart will go. And so God says, honor me with that that really represents a key place in your heart. And if you can't let go of that, there's something wrong with your honor toward God Almighty himself. I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you because I need an offering. I'm just, it's in the book. I preached this and taught this before I ever pastored. And I'm a recipient of the blessing that come from walking in the obedience just of the tithes, showing that honor unto God. Their blessings, whenever you return to God, notice what Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 19 says. He says, this is how the Lord responds. If you return to me, I will restore you. You see how God keeps promising that if you come back to me, I will restore you. You come back to me, I'm going to restore you. It's, it's for your benefit. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. He says, if you return to me, I will restore you so you can continually serve me. And notice he gives another qualifier here. If, 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 this is this a contingency. If you speak good words rather than worthless ones. The King James Version puts it this way. That if you are able to take the precious out of the vow, then I will make you as my mouthpiece. In other words, let me translate that for you. That God is saying that if you are able to look at people who have messed up, who have a terrible past, who've been prostitutes and drug addicts and thieves and murderers and liars, if you take all of those people and really be able to look at what they did and see a gift and a calling of God in them. The apostle Paul was writing to people in the church and he, he went down this, this litany of, of sins and then he's, he ended up with this. He says, and such were some of you. And such were some of you. You got to be able to look at somebody that was wilding out and all kind of freaky stuff and see a missionary in them. And see a preacher and see a church planner in them. Are you listening? You got to be able to look at a wino that is drunk and, and, and you know, stumbling over, over his words and somebody that's been strung out on dope and a sex addict and say, you know what? The Lord hath need of you. He can use you for his glory. And I'm just telling you, God will use you. You got to, God says, if you'll be able to do that and not come through a self-righteous lens and looking at other people and judging them and say, ew, ew, you did what? No, no, no. He's able to say, I'm able to see that even though you've done freakish stuff and done stuff in the darkness and put stuff in your veins and put detrimental stuff in your body, God is still able to use you. He's still able to take a person from a dark past who's been involved in the occult and witchcraft and all kind of sick stuff and God can use them for his glory and make them a mouthpiece for him. He says, if you're able to do that, to look at other folks that's in a game and look at other people that have committed violent crimes and have robbed and broken and entering and theft by taking and theft by receiving. If you can deal with that and people that have been there for deception and God can use that person, don't you know that he's saying, I'll use you if you return to me? He says, I will make you a mouthpiece and I'm going to redeem a people that's been living like hell was in them. He says, but I've got a new fire that I'm going to put on the inside of them and I will use their creativity. Those that have been doing lap dances, I'm going to sanctify them. I'm not going to take a dancing out of their feet. I'm going to help them to change partners and they're still going to dance 
if you were funny before you got saved, you're going to be funny after you get saved. And God will sanctify your humor and still let you make people laugh. You're still going to be a hoot. You're still going to be a character. God says, let them know I can and will use them. If you're like that, he says, when you return to me, I'm going to use you if you're able to be a mouthpiece and take the precious out of the vow. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. This is how we know that it's because of 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, he saved us according to and called us. He saved and called us. You're not just saved, you're saved and called. You're saved and called. You're saved and called with a holy calling. You're saved and called. You're saved and calling. Not according to our works. Not according to your freakiness. Not according to your addictions. Not according to your past hidden deeds, shameful deeds. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, anything that we have done, but according to his own purpose and his grace, which was given unto us in Christ Jesus before time began. That God says that this is not about you, this is about my purpose. I'm gonna use you for your glory, for his glory. I'm gonna use you for my glory is what God has said. I wanna use you for my glory. This is not about your past. He said, I know what you did in the past, but I have separated your sin as far as the east is from the west. I've separated your sin because the east and the west never meet. I've separated them. What you did back there doesn't matter. Your past, your past, listen to me, your past does not define you. It prepares you. It prepares you. It prepares you. It doesn't define you. Your past prepares you. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 21 says that a remnant will return. Yeah, the remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. And my question to you today is that will you be a part of that remnant? Will you be a part of the remnant that will return to the Lord? Will you be a part that will, that will return? And then he reminds us that when you return, you can't just return any kind of way. There are conditions to how we return to the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 3, then Samuel said to the people of Israel, if you want to return to the Lord with all your hearts, get rid of your foreign gods. Some of you have been living by your zodiac sign. Get rid of your foreign gods and your images of Astaroth, your tarot cards, your palm reading, your crystals. Uh, get rid of your foreign gods, your images of Astaroth. Get rid of all that foreign stuff. And he says, turn to me. Turn your hearts to the Lord and obey him alone. Then he will rescue you from the Philistine, from every enemy that's coming after you, for everything that is chasing you. You got to realize that there's something precious in you. That's why the devil won't turn you loose. I mean, the greater warfare that you have with the devil, it speaks of your giftedness. He's a thief. And why in the world would a thief be harassing somebody who doesn't have anything of value? And when you're dealing with undue pressure and you realize this thing, it is because you are gifted. It is because you are called. It's because you're anointed. It's because God has purpose for your life. That's the reason that you're having so much trouble. But when you get ready to return to the Lord, you got to get rid of this stuff. You got to get rid of your idols. You got to get rid of everything else. When I was about 13 years old, I had to take, I'd gone out and gotten a Ouija board because I was fascinated with, with the supernatural. And, and, and here I, I'm, I'm ready to open it up and, and, and let it guide my and ask it questions in a seance kind of an atmosphere. But you remember I said that when God wants to correct you, it'll begin with uh, the inward conviction of the Holy Ghost. I got convicted in my spirit before I could ever open the box. Or before I could open the box. I got it from a store I never will forget. Over at, it was called Sunshine over at the West End Mall. I got it over there, that, that demon box. And, and, and I got a conviction in my heart before I could ever open up to use it one time. And the Holy Ghost convicted me and said, go put it in the trash. Go put it in the trash. I went down in the basement and lifted the hood of that thing up and put that thing in the trash. I never played with it because I was called and I realized that God was calling me and the devil was trying to pollute my spirit. Yes, he did. 
Yes, he did. Yes, he did. After that, I came under one of the worst battles of suicidal thoughts. And I couldn't understand, where is this coming from? I'm not sad. I'm not depressed. I've never been depressed a day in my life. But a spirit of suicide came over me. Are you listening to this man of God right now? Can I be real with you? That was not about my past. It was about my future. It was about where I was going. I understand it now, what he was fighting. He would love to snuff you out before you become something. He would love to mess up your whole life and your thinking and derail you. If the devil can't stop you, he'll derail you. But thanks be unto God, hallelujah to Jesus. The path back to God is the same path that the prodigal had to take. He had to come through first to realize. The prodigal son had to realize, I'm far away from God. I'm in a far country. You know what a far country is? A far country is where you're living outside of the will of God, doing your own desires in a place where there's no restraint in your spirit. And that's where the prodigal was, in a far country. You can be in a far country and still living in your mom and daddy's house. A far country is not about territory physically. It's about a dimension in the realm of the spirit. A far country is where you have, you've distanced yourself from God. You've said, God, I don't want to be on your control. I want to live according to my own desires with no restraints. The far country is a place outside of the will of God. And then there, when he says, you want to return and realize, and the second thing is you have to remember. You have to remember that there's a father who loves you. He's got a robe waiting for you. He's got a ring. He's got shoes on your feet to restore you. He's going to restore you. You realize, you remember the third thing is that you repent. You repent. You say, God, I'm sorry. I want to come back to you. I repent. I miss you, God. And the fourth thing is you just return. You just, you just return. You return back to God. He's just looking for people that return. I remember years ago, as I would minister, I would close my message with this, this little song. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portal, He's waiting and watching, waiting for you and for me to come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. Earth Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinners, come home. If you feel God, if you're backslidden out of your wait with God, make your way down here, meet me here. Come home, come home, ye who are weary. tenderly Jesus is calling calling oh sinner come home he's calling you today sons and daughters prodigal sons and daughters come on come home come home Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come 
home. As we come today, we are coming because I need you. sons and daughters. There's room at the cross for you today. Come on. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Will you tell him once again, Lord, I need you. I need the old. Oh Lord, I need thee every hour, Lord. Yeah, every hour. I need thee. Ask God to break your heart with what breaks his. Oh, bless me now. This is the great return. I come to the thee. Tell him once again, Lord, I need you. I need They're still coming. has no way to bring atonement for your sin. They're still coming, they're still coming. He's still calling prodigal sons and daughters. I need thee, I need thee. Come on, I need the old. Ask him to wash you, ask him to cleanse you. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I see in the realm of the Spirit there are seven men that have gone through such deep brokenness. You've lost so much so much you've lost so much because of stuff that you did that wasn't right and you lost it the Lord said that I'm a God of restoration return to me and I'll restore if you let me restore your heart I'll be able to trust you and I'll be help you to rebuild in a short period of time the stuff that you lost I want those seven men to step out of the aisle and come right down here God is here 
in this room. I didn't give myself that word. That's a word for real men that are in this house right now. You come on down here. You get your life restored in the name of Jesus by the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost. God will give you a strategy. He'll give you hookups. God will give you divine connections. Are you listening to me? In the name of Jesus. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. God is up to something. God is a God of restoring. He'll restore your health. He'll restore your back. He'll restore your knees, your hips, your energy levels. Are you listening to me? You'll get your creative gift back. My God, my God. My God, here they come. They're still coming. They're still coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, 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 they're still coming, they're still coming, they're still coming. They're still coming, they're still coming. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I've got one other call that I hear the Holy Ghost saying to me. I can't turn this service loose until I obey God. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. God would arrest and stop the service for you, sir. Come on, Jesus. Come on. Come on, sir. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I, I, I hear the Lord say, you've been one of them bad dudes. Yeah. That you never saw yourself being saved and committed to God. Never. Yeah. Not you. And when you tell people that God has done that in your life, they're going to be shocked. But you were on a leash. And some prayers came out on your behalf. Step on out, sir. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on. Yes. Power in prayer. Yeah. Oh, yes, Lord. There's a woman here. You're a real influencer. And you've not been using your influence in a positive way that upbuilds a righteous cause that brings glory to God. But you're gifted and creative nonetheless. And you're influential nonetheless. And I heard the Lord say, the Lord hath need of you, handmaiden of the Lord. What you have is a prophetic gift that is distorted. It's a gift nonetheless. It has come from God. Where are you, sister? Step out. Step out. Yeah. 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 Yes! Just tell him yes, Lord. Tell him yes, Lord. Tell him, yes, Lord, I'll use it for your glory. Yes, for your glory, Lord. Yes, for your glory. Yes, for your glory. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jamie, I heard the Lord say that he's getting ready to give you another wave. 
He says, get ready for the wave. It's a swelling that's done by the Spirit of God by Himself. You didn't orchestrate it. You didn't think it up, but let it flow through you. You're getting ready to ride a wave. You're getting ready to ride a wave. Ride the wave. Ride it for His glory. For His glory is going to be where, look what the Lord has done. Look at what He's doing. But a wave is getting ready to swell in your life. It's getting ready to swell in your life. And it is for your good. It is for God's glory. It's for His glory. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. My, He's calling us back. He's calling gifts that didn't find their place in the church. He said, come back, come back, come back. Because God's going to use you in the marketplace like never before. He says, I'm not going to wait for Sunday to do the deliverance that I need to do this time. I'm not going to wait for Sunday to prophesy. It's going to happen in the marketplace. It'll happen by the elevator. It'll happen in the parking lot. It'll happen at the grocery store. You get ready, you get ready. I'm just here to tell you that if you'll put a sacrifice on the altar, the fire of God will fall. And the Spirit of God is getting ready now to do something. He's about to raise up a, a, a portion of the body of Christ that has been dormant, spectators in the seats. But now there comes the divine empowerment of the Spirit of God that's getting ready to pull you up out of your seat. And God's getting ready to set a trumpet in your voice. And he's going to send the wind to your sail. You set your sail and God will send the wind. You set your sail and God will send the wind. You set your sail and God will send the wind. And the Spirit of God is going to move, I'm telling you, here in the earth. And he says, and all flesh shall see it together. Your sons and your daughters. Your sons and your daughters. Your sons and your daughters this time. They're going to prophesy. They're going to prophesy. They're going to prophesy. They're going to prophesy. They'll see something. Prophecy. They'll say something. Prophecy. They'll prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord is going to be released in a brand new measure in these days. And you will watch the Spirit of God do something. And you'll realize this is not the work of a man, but this is the ordination of a God. You wonder, could God use you with your background and with the things that you have done and what you've come from? Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. How dare you let the devil disqualify you by your past? Your past did not disqualify you. It prepared you for a work of the Holy Ghost that God would do in your life to where people, when they look at you, they'll say that this was not the work of man, but this is the grace of God that has moved in this person's life. Stretch your hand toward these folks. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for what you're doing in the lives of these people and for them that have heard your, your call. Thank you for drawing them with bands of love today. You drew them by your own spirit. Thank you. Thank you. You said, God, that nobody can come to you except you draw them. God, and before you today are gifts and talents and abilities that we lay at the, on the altar. We place ourselves, God, as a sacrifice to say, Lord, consume us. Let your fire fall and consume us. May we now, God, present our own bodies as the living sacrifice on the altar so that your fire might fall on us. Move, God, on us. Breathe on us once again. God, at this time when you put breath to our lungs, may it be filled with a word that you put on our lips let it blow through God in a way that becomes unstoppable father I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll give us witty ideas to be able to speak truth in an uncompromising way and may it go viral may it go viral may it go viral and lift up a standard lift up a standard may a standard be created oh God I pray God that you'll just use us for your glory heal every hurt let the power of the blood of Jesus Christ go through and cleanse every place where the stain of sin and may a crimson stain of the blood be left as a marker. God, because our victory was won at Calvary, at the cross, and today we thank you for the power of the cross in the lives of these, your precious people. Thank you for calling us, God, to come back, to get back into what you've anointed us to do, what you've appointed us to do, to be who and what you've called us to be, God. May your kingdom come and your will be done on the earth through us in the name of Jesus. 
May your power fill us from the crown of our heads, God, to the soles of our feet. God, and may you place those in our path that we are duty-bound to minister to on the left and on the right, in front of us and behind us. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will unleash the Holy Ghost in us in brand new measures this time. For our good, God, but for your glory. What you started us, started in us today, God. Don't let it stop until it has been culminated by the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you for who you are. We bless you. We honor you. We adore you today. And we give you permission, God, that what you've started in us today kindle a fire that cannot be extinguished. But the more that we try to fan it, the more that it will spread. The more we fan it, the more it spreads. The more we fan it, the more it spread. Until the whole earth is set ablaze by your glory, your power, your spirit, and your word. Thank you, God, for being a consuming fire. May you consume everything in our life and in our past and in our memory that is unlike you. Father, thank you for redeeming us out of the far country of where we were just living without restrictions. But now, Father, will we come under the tutelage of the Holy Ghost based upon the solidity of the principles of the Word of God to have our feet firmly planted and established in your truth and following the voice of the Holy Spirit that says this is the way walk ye in it thank you father thank you father for what you've done for us in us to us for what you are doing and for the best part of what you're going to do in jesus name amen god bless you we love you we hope that you enjoyed that message don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos and if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.